Hi, Kevin. Hello. Hello. I've been asked to ask you about climate change and how you see climate change from the perspective of the magnetic energy model that you're espousing. And I'm rather imagining that you're going to be approaching it from a different point of view from mm -hmm. most of the debates that I've seen, heard. And uh, in fact, there seems to be more heat generated by the debate than there is by the greenhouse gases, I think, sometimes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so, you know, it's an ongoing debate. It's been going for years now. No one really seems to have the answer. No one seems to really know what needs to be done, if right. anything. Right. It can be done or whatever. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what your point of view is because I rather expect that it's going to be different. So, <laughs> can I? Uh, <laughs> oh. Just go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let me, let me say one thing real quick first that um, just the idea of our current system and the amount of toxins that we pump into the atmosphere even if the carbon dioxide monoxide and just go down there's lists of dozens of toxic chemicals that that humanity pumps into the atmosphere right now into the oceans everything else so let's just say for just for a minute just for the sake of the argument that even if those pollutants did not cause global warming it's still beyond absurd that we are polluting our environment like that. There's no justification in my mind, and, and I would hope in most people's minds, for polluting our world the way we are polluting it right now, regardless of whether it actually makes the temperature go up or not. There's no justification for putting that amount of pollution into our atmosphere. It's disgusting, it's a disgrace, it's a disservice to ourselves, to the environment, to the animals, the plants, everything. So. Let me just make that clear. Mm -hmm. But I will say though that the pollutants are still a factor and still an issue, okay? So now I'm not gonna take a side necessarily on this, like I'm 100% pro climate change, like, you know, I, I'm not gonna take a side, but what I am gonna do is try to offer the magnetic energy perspective on this, which is an etheric model. And, and hopefully that will kind of shed some light on, on what's happening from that perspective. So it's so, from, from the magnetic energy world, we've got to look at the, our planet as this system of energy exchange, etheric energy exchange, that is continuous, that is dependent on very precise and delicate balancing of magnetic resonances throughout our atmosphere, throughout the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, and all the way to the interior of the planet. So it's very dependent on this balance. And we have this notion in conventional science right now that a molecule is a molecule is a molecule. Like, so for example, you'll hear people often say, well, this isn't what we're doing in terms of pollution, like say, let's just hit like diesel, for example, diesel exhaust from ships, from tankers, from industrial sources, and then also just the, the pollution that comes from power plants, like a conventional coal generated power plant. And, and, they, and you'll often hear that those molecules that are being put into the atmosphere are, are like almost identical to what happens in a natural process such as a volcanic eruption. You know, like it's no different than what the Earth's always done, but we're doing a small, small portion compared to what the Earth's always done. But here's what's gonna happen, and I'm just gonna throw this out there as a prediction of the future, because that's partly what this model is for, is predicting how things will be thought of as this technology becomes full-fledged and it's fully developed. Scientists will analyze the difference between the pollution that is produced by conventional technology and the gases and the elements that are produced by natural processes. And they're going to see that there's not only a tremendous difference at the subatomic magnetic resonance level, but there are, there are processes that take place within our planet and that includes volcanic eruptions 
that serve to help balance a whole system of magnetic resonance signatures. There's, there's stuff that comes out of volcanoes that is highly beneficial to the environment, which we all know from even, from even a crop perspective or a growing perspective. Or, but I mean, it's more than just that though. There are resonant signatures that the earth vibrates well with that come out of those volcanoes. That's completely different than what's being done at a, at a coal-fired power plant, for example, or a, or a diesel-powered tanker that just completely just lets off tons and tons of pollution every trip it makes across the Atlantic or the Pacific. So the difference will become very apparent and the difference of integration of those molecules into an energetic system will become very apparent that they, they integrate very differently. Um, let me give another example that's kind of radical and then I'll, uh, if you want, just jump in any time and you can interrupt me with a question. Sure. So the moon and the earth have this incredible magnetic energy slash gravitational connection with a, with a vortex that is very powerful. You could liken it to a steel cable that's 100 miles wide. That's the power of, that's the strength of it. It's incredibly powerful. This is a magnetic energy connection that is constantly in a process of exchange through an etheric flow, and it keeps the moon in a very precise orbit. It keeps the distance very precise. It keeps everything about the moon precise. This is not a happenstance thing. The moon is not some random thing. This is a very well-designed system, designed system. And I'm not even exaggerating on that. The moon over time does not naturally lose its orbit or, or have its orbit extend because the magnetic, the, the gravitational field between the moon and the earth, they are precisely linked to be at a very specific distance. But when you have things like oil spills in the oceans, and you start to change the viscosity of the water, that magnetic resonance of that moon, that connection is affected. So, and the, the reason I'm saying this is to demonstrate how delicate the system is. That energy is designed and, and it's polarized to connect to our planet and to help stir ocean water to help bring up cool water from the depths to generate uh, what we think of as the generating the weather, the tides, everything. It, it has a host of functions and it's not just that, it contributes to a continuous stream of magnetic energy and resonant signatures that feed into our earth that go through an entire system and then come out to, through volcanic activity, through, ocean, through, through the surface, through to help basically sustain our, our lives. And it's very critical on so many levels, not just what we see and hear and touch, but on an etheric level as well. And when you change the viscosity of the water around the planet, you affect the connection between the moon and the earth. And that, not only does that contribute to climate change, it contributes to storms, it contributes to a lot of things because Things like El Nino and El Nina and these, these warm bodies of water, the moon is less effective at doing its job if the viscosity of the water isn't exactly the way it's supposed to be. And so one of the things that we would do in the, in the advent of magnetic energy technology coming forth is we would thoroughly clean the oceans and remove the molecular structures of petroleum that have been spilled around the world because the, that connection needs to come back to a harmonious, stable connection with the moon because that generates a lot of activity. Now, back to the overall climate change and the pollution of climate change. From the magnetic energy model, and it, this is an etheric model, anything that has to do with pressure and, and an unbalance and an imbalance of pressure is related to this model. So when you think about in terms of pressure in, you know, you hear about what the pressure is of the weather system on a daily basis. We'll, they'll talk about that on the news or you can look it up online and how pressure fluctuates wildly with, 
within a, a tornado or a hurricane. Anything that has to do with a pressure buildup. And now, now let's just, let me include as well, volcanic activity and earthquake activity, because those are pressure related systems. Anything that has to do with the pressure or an imbalance of pressure is an etheric model related activity. Okay, because that's how the whole system works. And when something is out of balance and that pressure, the energy can't move through the system properly, it builds up pressure. And so it will cause, for example, now, and in a normal harmonious planet, there's a given amount of pressure that's always happening and that's good, that's healthy, that's part of the natural geological evolution of the planet. But when you have human activity that is impacting the the geophysical magnetic resonance signatures around the planet, like the ionosphere, the, the ozone layer, all the fields that we depend on to be in such perfect alignment. When you have technology that starts to influence those fields and change those fields, you influence the pressure related to the balancing of the system. And that's why I like, for example, from a magnetic energy point of view, this year has had a record number of, of hurricanes that have been named. And so that, that is directly related to this model. Anything that has to do with a vortex of energy or a change in pressure is directly related to a magnetic energy resonance response, a response between the ionosphere, the planet, and more than just that. And so as the system is thrown out of whack, thrown out of balance, it will attempt to regain that balance. It will attempt to do that through rebalancing the ionosphere, rebalancing those energy fields, that's what it does. That's the whole point of the system. That's the whole point of the delicacy of it. And, and so you're looking at like hurricanes, tornadoes, those type of things. Yes, they are directly related, but here's the problem. Okay. Humanity right now is measuring ridiculously simple things like what's the temperature. And that's not really the best thing to be measuring. So like, what's the ocean temperature? What's the surface temperature? What's the atmosphere temperature? We're doing, and the temperature is, is not really that telling of what's really happening. And, what hap and when we move into this magnetic energy model, we have this technology, what we will be measuring is what are the resonant signatures coming into our planet and leaving our planet? And what is the imbalance that is happening in that? Because that, that tells us the true story of what's really happening with the climate. See, in the magnetic energy model, you can have extremes that take place when the system is out of balance. So you may have extreme heat, you may have extreme cold. It depends on how the system is trying to rebalance. One thing that you will consistently have, though, is you will have extreme weather events. You'll, you'll tend to have a, a, an increase in volcanic activity or an increase in earthquake activity. These type of things are, are larger system rebalancing processes. And so you can have both things. And so when you hear scientists saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, it really looks like we're entering into a small ice age or into a mini ice age. And then other scientists saying, wait, no way, we're, this is the hottest the planet's been for 2 million years or whatever. From a magnetic energy perspective, it's like, okay, just stop with the, the, the kindergarten level of analysis and looking at temperature only. We have to look at the energy fields and the resonant signatures around the planet to really get the true story of what's going on because it may in fact be true that both things are happening. We are having heating up, we are having cooling at the same time. And that's partly because of what's happening with the energy fields around the planet. And so it's really, what we're doing is right now, the, 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 the technology, our influence is exacerbating a natural process that we're already engaged in. And it's doing it on multiple levels. It's doing it not only atmospherically, and one indication of that is when you have what we call sprites or high ionospheric electrical activity, that is a very intense form of lightning that is high in the ionosphere, and they call it, they'll often call it space lightning. And this is a very, when you get, when, when you have a discharge that's taking place at the outer edge of the ionosphere, that is the planet giving you a very strong indication that 
things need to be balanced. And when that, when those discharges start to increase in, you know, in activity and, and you see incredible amounts of, of high atmospheric lightning, high ionospheric or space lightning around the planet, that's a very strong indicator that the system is really pulling hard pulling hard and i say that intentionally because it's an attract field this is based on an attract system and it's and so it's really trying to pull energy up and pull and then move energy down but really trying to rebalance that outer atmosphere if if we had magnetic technology online what we would be doing is we would be carefully carefully analyzing the outer edge of the ionosphere and very carefully examining the correct ratios for the not only the elements but the, the the combustibility of the elements and the elemental factors so like in the in the magnetic energy model you will have like earth air sound speed and light and we would carefully be monitoring those elemental ratios those those combustible ratios to make sure that they are correct around the planet. That gives you the true story of what's really happening with the energy fields on the planet. And not only that, the predictability of what's going to happen. Because as you learn to really read the ionosphere, you learn how to predict things like volcanoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, all those weather patterns, all that energy is preemptive. It's a preemptive manifestation of a magnetic pull, a draw that happens in the ionosphere and in the upper ionosphere. And a lot of scientists already know this. I'm not saying anything new. I'm not giving some sort of revelation here. There's a lot of scientists, even in black ops programs, that know this and they have technology that actually really takes advantage of what I'm saying in a negative way, though. But I mean, you know, they're not trying to necessarily help things. They're trying to use that field, that ionospheric field to their advantage to create and disturb things in the way that they want to. But so they've learned how connected the ionosphere is to the global system. And, and so that's really from a climate change point of view. Yes, we are, we're changing, we're swinging, we're getting more and more radical. And until we stop with the current technology that we have, the system is going to always be in a state of pulling hard to rebalance, so. Okay, so uh, uh, as always, you've said an awful lot there, <laughs> uh, makes questions. And one of the questions would be, you say that there are scientists who know that what you've just been saying, you know, who also know uh, everything that you've been saying, but I've never heard this in the mainstream and I'm sure that a lot of our viewers have never heard it either. And why, why are we not hearing it in the mainstream? Well, I think partly because they're, they're under wraps or they're in, they're in basically in that type of technology that they have. Right. <laughs> just, at the, just at the most not gonna moment, about. the, the, uh, the screen sc uh, froze and I didn't hear what you said. Just you were saying, why? You know, how is it? We don't hear all it. I tried, <laughs> all I tried to do is say that they're in top secret programs and they're already cutting the connection. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to name any names or anything. <laughs> you just but, start, start that bit again, would you? you know, how is it um, the, main, the scientists, uh, the mainstream scientists are not saying it? but so No, they're not. And, and that's the thing is, and I think that hopefully one thing that happens, see, now let's just bring back to the bigger picture. So the planet, we're right now in this like lower vibration of energy. We're right getting right up to the end of this cycle that we're in. And, and, and that cycle leads to changes in consciousness, changes in magnetic vibration and all kinds of things. This whole decade that we're entering into is a radical change of, of everything. On the other side of that, as we start to move into a more enlightened, global awareness, if you will, what we call enlightenment, hopefully at that point, this type of secret knowledge that has been held by government agencies and, and corporate agencies around the world will start to be shared openly and start to infiltrate academia, 
so that the people that are the, you know, all your PhDers and all your typical scientists around the globe that are kind of in this, this ongoing game, the charade of science, even though you've got all these other scientists and top secret programs that are working with completely different sets of theories and principles and technology and awarenesses and everything. Hopefully all that other, that higher stuff's gonna infiltrate and that will start to become the common denominator of education, especially for science of saying, you know what, gosh, sorry guys, you know, we've already known all this for decades. And it's time that we actually start putting it in textbooks and teaching people how the system really works because it really is a magnetic electro. And I'll put electro second because the, the primary reaction, especially in an etheric magnetic energy model, the primary reaction is always magnetic first. The electro part of it, like people will say, well, oh, lightning's electrical, lightning's electrical. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is it's probably, from our point of view, it's primarily a magnetic response. It's due to a magnetic field, a vortex, a draw that forms first, and that discharge is nothing more than the byproduct of what's already happening at a magnetic etheric level. And so, you know, so it's a magnetic electro system that is full of a countless number of sensitive resonances that need to be in harmony with each other in order for the system to properly function. And when you throw like electrical technology into that mix, you start completely disrupting the natural fields around the planet and disrupting this whole process. And, and the system has to try to rebalance. It, 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 partly the reason it's rebalancing, and this is, gets kind of into a weird thing, is that it's, in a way, it's programmed to rebalance. So all the natural systems, all the natural elements, all the natural things around our planet, those are highly interconnected. And I, and I often call them in videos, we call them higher dimensional templates. Like there's higher dimensional templates to all of those elemental structures, to all of those systems. And that helps guide how the whole system functions. And so anything outside of those templates creates immediate resistance in the etheric flow because the, ether the etheric energy, which is flowing at an extraordinarily high rate, and it's a, con it's a constant. So it's 24 seven and anything that starts to interfere with that flow or distort that flow or block that energy starts creating problems in the environment. That's, that's what we should be measuring. Temperature is, temperature is nothing more than a byproduct of other things that are taking place, but it doesn't give us the true story of what needs to be changed and what we need to do as a species to correct it. it it's just, it, it's not enough is what it is. It's just a very small indicator and there's a whole other list of indicators that are way more important that will tell us what we need to do to survive as a race, to survive as, as, as humanity. And so, you know, what really needs to take place. So if, if there is such a thing as climate change, and I think most of us feel that the climate is changing to some degree, yeah. you're saying that it's, it, this is a part of a rebalancing process. Right? Absolutely. And let me just say this. So let's say- not capable of rebalancing without, you know, without, is, I mean, is, is the climate change going to get more and more severe or is it going to ease off because nature is- No, it's, it's definitely going to get more severe as, as these, until we have changes in our technology on this planet. It will become more severe. There's, it, and it's going to continue that process. And I don't know if there's really any way around that. If you turned off, if you turned off every power plant right now and you stopped every single combusting engine from running right now, our planet is designed so effectively at rebalancing. Like think about the, the vortices that take place in the atmosphere and in the water. There's a lot of etheric energy that happens in those. There's a lot of transmutation. There's a lot of redistribution. We saw it really, actually, we saw it this year with COVID and, and, and how clean 
the air got so fast mm -hmm. and and the earth is fully capable of cleaning this the the atmosphere and and even the water but the water is a little different of a story but the atmosphere for sure in a very short period of time i mean in one year we would probably see a 90 percent improvement but as long as we continue to pump all that pollution into the atmosphere and 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 we create those fields that are disturbing the ionosphere and the ozone layer and all that we're going to have a system that is always trying so hard to maintain balance and to clean up i mean you know humanity here's what humanity is like right now we are like <laughs> <laughs> brace yourselves we are like a a worker in a nuclear power plant that's having a, a small leak we're smoking cigarettes we're on several cell phones at once and there's garbage burning right in where we're working i mean there's so much crap going on in our environment right now that needs to be dealt with and that's the thing is when you have technology that can remove radioactive pollution, when it can take the toxins out of the environment, when it can stop EMF damage. I mean, this, the EMF soup that we are in right now is unprecedented. And with 5G technology rolling out around the planet, it's just getting exponentially more intense. And all of that, all of that plays a part in how the, the energy fields around our planet are impacted. These are sensitive fields. And when you start generating EMFs of all sorts of frequencies, and now we're up into the millimeter range and we're, we're broadcasting that, not, not only that, but we have, good God, hundreds of military frequencies that are always night and day that blanket the globe. So, I mean, you just think that's all of that impacts how this system functions. And the system is designed to have electromagnetic fields disrupting the etheric process. It's just not designed for that. And so that's part of the reason why that type of technology is so damaging and so and causes so many problems. Because the makers of the <laughs> the makers <laughs> of the system were not like, well, you know what? Let's make this ready for electricity. We, we're, you know, let's make everything really compatible with EMFs. And let, oh, you know what? Let's also make it so that they can have hundreds of nuclear power plants contamination because the system will love that. They, they didn't do that. It's not built that way. It's built to stay natural. It's built, built to stay in very clean, harmonious resonant signatures. And, and all the technology paths that we've gone down with this very limited and dark consciousness, this is, this is gonna be looked at as a dark era of science, these last hundred or so years. And it's just gonna, this is, and, and all of that, that very limited perspective, and that idea of trying to control nature and trying to force our will upon the system, all of that's gotta stop. And, and it's <laughs> there's well, the idea that we fossil. need to stop using fossil fuels, for example, and you know taking various other measures that, that, that a lot of people are suggesting is is, is valid to, to to some degree. Uh, yeah. The question is to what to what degree is is it valid? I mean, I, 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 I think it's valid to a hundred percent degree. Fossil, what are called fossil fuels? I mean, in the magnetic world, in the magnetic model. This is a more of an abiotic model, partly because of, so as the, as the etheric flow comes into our planet and that in the interior of our planet, there's a lot of transmutation that takes place, elemental transmutation, elemental generation. And part of that process is to generate what ultimately becomes what we have labeled petroleum. And that, that is part of the interior functioning of this planet, particularly to help provide the correct lubrication around this planet. In the etheric magnetic energy model of the universe, planets are designed along with other structures, if you will, like stars and like anything that has a consistent etheric flow, like a vortex in, a vortex out, a gravitational field that's, that's an etheric magnetic energy field, 
that type of system is designed to grow and expand over billions of years. And part of the growth and expansion of that process is having the elements necessary and the chemistry necessary to create a smoother transition into expansion. So when you have plate tectonics that are involved in earthquake activity, and, and it's no mystery because these oil companies have, they quickly, quickly discovered, wow, you know what? One of the best sources of oil is right where the plates meet. <laughs> so let's just drill all over the earth <laughs> where the plates meet. And because that's really easy, easy pickings for the oil. So let's bump, pump out millions and millions of gallons of that oil, never thinking to themselves, wow, you know what? This could really become a problem because as the model, as the Earth starts to expand and we've literally removed most of the lubrication, the pressure, the pressure will build up to the point where that expansion will still take place, but it will take place in a very destructive and turbulent and rough manner because the lubrication has been removed. So that's another example of how the whole system is designed for growth, expansion, evolution. It's all an open system. There's an etheric generation. And that's why they go, wow, gosh, we thought the oil peak was gonna happen, but for some reason we get there and, no, oh, it's been replenished, it's, repl it's been replenished, it's been replenished. Well, cause this part of the process of the planet is to create oil, oil, what actually results in oil from the interior, from the etheric flow, it's an open system. So we're not, this whole idea that, oh my God, there's a limited amount that it's, you know, and now I'm not going to tell this type of information could be completely misused from a lower level of consciousness. Because they'll say, wait, 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 are you telling me that we're in an open system and oil is forever? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we can have all the oil we want forever and ever and ever. No, that's not the point of this discussion, okay? That's not the point of this discussion. And at the rate that we're extracting it, it we, would, we would drain it anyway. But that's, that's not the point of it. The point of it is that the earth produces it out of necessity. It's part of a very vital system that you should not be extracting. And not only that, it needs to stay where it is. It can't become part of the water. <laughs> it can't become part of the oceans. Those oceans, currents and all that is a very sensitive process. It needs to flow exactly the way it does untouched. And that's why in this model, in this, in this enlightenment era that we're moving into, hopefully, the earth will be treated as a sanctuary. It will be respected, it will be loved, it will be nurtured, and it will be cleaned and allow it to flourish the way it's actually built to do. So, so for the meantime, we've got to put up with this climate change. And unless we become sure enlightened before our time, as it were, Right. I suddenly decide now that we're, you know, we're going to take it seriously and we have to stop using the fossil fuels and we have to stop polluting the oceans and everything else. Well, and think about the salinity of, of the oceans. That's a huge problem too. And, and you know, like the North American current and these, like, these, these problems. So when you have the earth responding in extremes, and so you have waves of heat, you have waves of cold, you have rapid melt off. At the same time, you have rapid escalation of, of glacier building. At the same time, you have rapid melt off. And as you, as the earth goes through this process, when you have a tremendous amount of fresh water that enters into the salinity of an ocean and interrupts that current flow and interrupts what's happening in that global system, again, you're changing, we, I, or what, you know, and I will say humanity is contributing to that. There's no question about it. We are helping to change a very delicate system that depends on very specific magnetic energy resonant signatures in that water to have those currents flow a certain way. And, and the simple explanation is, well, yeah, because fresh water rises to the top and it causes the salt water to go underneath. That's a very simple explanation, but it goes much deeper than that because those resonant signatures in seawater, the elemental ratios in seawater, they are part of what happens with the lunar connection and the atmospheric connection, the, the, that 
they move a certain way because of the chemical and, and magnetic energy elemental ratios in that water. So it's, it's more than just this simple physical process. There's an energetic process that happens that helps generate ocean currents. And you can tell one of the biggest indicators of that is watch the vortex action around the world, not only with waves, but with, with, with currents and how everything moves from very large vortices that could be literally hundreds of miles in diameter to small ones that take place constantly. Anytime you see that type of vortex action, you can be sure that there is a high level of etheric exchange happening in that system because that's how it works. That's how the energy is trans it's transferred, if you will. It's transferred into the system. And certain water, the elemental ratios in that water is a very critical process to that because all those vortices, they all have elemental signatures that are happening. And it's just like in our, in our units, for example, a vortice of energy, a vortex of energy will only grab the, the things, it'll only like 100% grab, and then you can draw the curve, you can draw the graph, we'll go down, down, down. The, the further apart those elemental signatures are from the actual generation of that vortex, the less interaction that that system has. I, I hope I'm explaining that right. So in a vortex of energy, there are, there are magnetic resonant energy signatures. Whatever that vortex is affecting has signatures that are related to that. There's an attract process in there. If we change the elemental ratio or salinity or the chemical ratio of water, we change that interaction and it becomes, and now draw the graph. The more we change it, the less interaction, the less, the less that happens. Okay, so let me give you a really good example of this. Dead spots in the ocean. That's not natural. There are large areas of the ocean that are literally dead. They are, they are vacant of oxygen. They are vacant of life. That is because we have affected the, the magnetic resonance signatures that happen and those vortices can't function as properly. They can't function at the full effect that they're used to. So they don't transfer or the, like they don't transfer like oxygen and other elements as effectively as they do. They're way down the graph in those areas. And because we've added chemicals, we've, we've changed the salinity, we've changed the elemental ratios, we've changed the viscosity, all of these things. And, and then it's not just that, we've changed the whole system so that the water doesn't circulate the way it's supposed to from deep levels to high levels with these continuous incredible vortices that are normally happen all around the planet in the oceans. Those are not, they are not transporting the elements, the ratios, the oxygen, the nitrogen, all of these things, they're not transporting it as effectively as they would with an untouched system. So humanity has made deep, deep impacts on how the life in the oceans is, is being impacted, how the actual dynamics, the magnetic dynamics of the oceans have changed because of what humanity has done. So, I mean, you've, that's a big deal. And that's one of the reasons why with magnetic technology, we will work very, very hard at restoring the oceans to the state that they need to be because that's kind of like the life of this planet. I mean, mm -hmm. that water is very, very critical to our weather systems, our temperatures, everything. I mean, it's a big deal. Well, another example, I think, of what you're talking about is that people talk about the Gulf Stream slowing down or stopping. Yes, that's a now, perfect that's example. A huge difference to the climate here in Great Britain because... Yes. We owe our relatively mild and benign climate to the Gulf Stream. That's exactly right. I think that you know the whole of Northern Europe would, uh, you know, would, the temperatures would plunge to something like, uh, I suppose, Northern Canada. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas at the moment we get something more like, you know, halfway down the east coast of of America, something that's you know relatively warm. Right. Well, and you know, it sounds crazy, but I know there's a lot of truth in science fiction over the decades. 
And even the movie, um, The Day After Tomorrow, there's a, there's some truth in that movie. Now, granted, it's it's an exciting and action filled movie, and it's you know, oh my God, it's the day after tomorrow. So I mean, but 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 besides that, though, the actual dynamics of the atmosphere, the dynamics of the relationship with the ocean, if you took the magnetic energy model and you started to explain the inner workings of what's happening from magnetic and a magnetic energy point of view, there's I mean, there's a lot of truth to the principles that are described in that movie. Um, you know, so it's that Gulf Stream, that current, and and why it's changing, and the impacts of that changing are very real, and and how the relationship with gravity and the moon and the ocean currents and the salinity changes, and the you know adding fresh water and the dump of fresh water and and all of that, it's all a system that's very interconnected, and again, it's an open system with an etheric flow, and that etheric flow needs to be very precise. It's a very delicate process. And it, we can't afford to have pollution in it. We just can't. It, it doesn't work well with pollution. So to the extent that the climate is changing, uh, are you saying that mostly this is due to, it's man-made? This is not purely one of the cycles of time that brings well. Well, the, the, yeah, there's so I think there's both things happening. And now, so let me touch on something because this is, this is again, going to be very controversial. And, and, and the only, only if, if anyone in a top secret program, they'll go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks for saying that. But everyone else is going to go, you're off your freaking rocker. <laughs> so, yes, I think what humanity is doing and what we've done for the last hundred years is definitely a very big impact. It's a very huge contribution to what's happening on the planet right now in terms of climate change, in terms of geophysical changes, in, chain, in terms of all, all the things that we've been talking about. And yes, we are also in a natural process. So we are moving through a natural process as well. But that natural process is being very significantly exacerbated by what humanity has done. Now, a lot of debunkers to the climate change model will say, this is all due to the sun. The changes are in the sun. It has nothing to do with the earth. The sun is cooling down. The sun is heating up. It's all due to the sun. From a magnetic energy perspective and from an etheric model perspective, the earth and the sun are intimately linked. There is a continuous exchange of energy between the earth and the sun. What we are doing on the planet, especially from an elemental distortion point of view, and that includes like all the nuclear power plants, every time we centrifuge, you know, uranium, or we create a whole dozens of these highly radioactive elements that don't have an etheric matching template. They do not flow with etheric energy. They literally create deadly fields around them, buildup of deadly fields. There is, there is no safe way from a conventional point of view to, to make those fields benign. Now, now, granted, now there are a lot of good breakthroughs, breakthroughs, and so I'm not saying that because even conventionally speaking, there are some really good breakthroughs on how to handle nuclear waste and all that. From a magnetic energy point of view, we would render all of those completely inert instantaneously. Okay, so we would remove all of that. But until that happens, our system is is totally contaminated with the distorted elements, the artificial elements, the man-made elements, if you will, that we have created. Those molecular structures, just because the stuff's buried in salts in Utah or something, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that that energy doesn't travel throughout the system because everything's an open system. You can't close something off and think, oh my God, well, don't worry about it. It's safe right here. You know, we've got all the fuel rods, you know, they're stored in this nice little area inside the power plant, everything's cool. It doesn't work that way. Everything's an open system. Everything circulates everything. And that includes our connection to the sun. The sun is also a response to what happens on this planet, not only this planet, but on other planets. But right now we're the <laughs> we're the dirty little planet in the solar system. <laughs> we're, the, we're the contaminating planet, the one that has all the pollution, all the garbage, all the distorted fields, the distorted electrical fields that we produce, the distorted elemental ratios and fields. So all of that is part of the resonant signatures that connect 
with our planet and the sun. And the, and the sun, as part of this system, the global system, it has the same, the sun has the same exact elemental ratio formula, if you will, as our planet and the other planets. So we are designed to be together. The earth and the sun are designed to be in the same harmonious system together. We are designed to have the same magnetic resonance signatures and etheric flows. And if one of them distorts, the other one starts to compensate as well because the, the connection is instantaneous. So when you have a nuclear test or you have a whatever it is, that response is instantaneous. It's beyond the speed of light. And that response is continuous. There's a, always a flow of energy that's back and forth, back and forth between the earth and the sun. And as the sun, now this is going to be controversial too, because they're going to say, well, that's not true. That's not true. The solar cycles have been disrupted from our normal, pol our normal um, polar shifts or, or our polarity shifts, what they call polarity shifts. What it really is, is it's the etheric exchange is changing. The etheric exchange changes in, in cycles in the, in the sun. The vortex coming in and the vortex coming out. And it does that for, I don't even want to get into why it does that. There's a lot of reasons in our connection to the galaxy and the gravitational field, the magnetosphere, um, the, the helio sheath around our solar system, all of that is highly connected to that process. But we as humans have disrupted that cycle with what we have done. And that's why the sun, even in weird times when they were supposed to be silent, has produced like X-class flares and crazy kind of responses that solar scientists have been like, we have no idea why it's doing this. We are supposed to be dead cold right now, and we are completely getting like flare after flare. And then after, and then all of a sudden you'll have this dead silence. They're like, well, oh my God, the sun's, you know, well, now we're moving into another cycle, but it's not responding the way it was supposed to because we have disrupted the cycle. Humanity and the technology and the elemental ratios are thrown off, our fields are thrown off, and we have disrupted the cycle. So the sun is doing its part to cleanse its energy field to essentially redistribute or transmute because it's it's a great transmuter of elements to transmute what is not correct and there's a lot of force behind that so like the etheric flow pushes and pushes and pushes against elemental elemental like ratios or elemental um, molecular structures that are not naturally flowing and it'll push and push and push and push and push until it, it's, there's explosions there's flares there's everything and so Part of that process is we are entering into a new solar cycle in this decade and we are going to see some pretty intense activity solar activity and part of that is is because there's still this need for the system to redistribute those those elemental signatures those molecular signatures that are causing that are that are being created if you will we're not creating anything but we're that are being distorted on our planet and that interconnectivity, we have a constant flow of energy, magnetic energy between the earth and the sun. And, and part of that flow contains those contaminated, those warped, those distorted energetic signatures. And the sun is going to do its part to continue to do that. So my point of all of that long dissertation is even the impact from the sun still comes back from a magnetic energy etheric model, it still comes back to contributions humanity has made. Does that make sense? Yeah, we so are not independent of the sun. During the last few decades, it seemed that the sun has been getting a lot brighter and whiter. I mean, could that could be more intense? Is that yeah. Something? Yeah. And but then all of a sudden, then you have this incredible, these incredible power drops. So like you'll see the imp, the, the output of the sun goes whoo, like this, and then it'll go up like this, and it goes whoo, like this. It's 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 erratic because it's it's in this position of like holy crap, you know. I'm like trying really hard to to get rid of this these elemental signatures that don't belong here, and at the same time, then I'm responding. I'm like so you're seeing radical shifts of of energetics outputs of the sun. 
of weird solar flares that don't make any sense of their timing and then these dead periods and then the how the poles are doing weird things around the sun and it, there's you know the inflow and outflow is it's it's all very very interesting and well that, i mean that right there could make a huge impression on uh, humanity if if we were to learn that actually the way the, the way the sun behaves is due to what we're doing it's connected I mean, there is a connection that could have been the case right so we are again humanity and what we've done technologically we exacerbate that process from an etheric model because see the, here's the thing the conventional model says we are completely isolated the earth has no impact on the sun whatsoever we're isolated from the sun but in the etheric model there's nothing that's isolated we are intimately connected with the sun at a speed far beyond light with magnetic resonance signatures that are very sensitive and there are fields that are compatible with us and the sun they have identical literally they have identical ratios of of magnetic resonance signatures and our whole solar system is like that the the formula if you will that guides the balance of energy in this in our system is for our entire solar system and so as we have impacted that we've impacted the sun we've impacted the whole solar system and now that gets a little crazy but you'll see that there's even been reports from nasa of strange things like volcanic activity and things happening on other planets all like all of the other planets and there and, and that, because i do yeah. too so you're saying that what we're what we're doing is impacting on other planets like that yes i mean that that we that they're like well this is really weird because not only are we heating apparently seem to be heating up even from the inside out not just the atmosphere but from underwater volcanica like the earth appears to be heating up from the inside out other planets in the solar system appear to be heating up from the inside out and that would be the etheric model of change of rebalancing and now that could be part of a, a natural process that we're going through, but it, the whole system is also designed with the same exact magnetic resonance signatures as our planet, and it's going to want to try to maintain balance. And the energy that we contribute to the system is spread throughout the solar system and beyond, but throughout the solar system. So it's like every, and all those planets have etheric flows flowing through them. None of them are isolated. We aren't isolated from any other planet. We're connected to every other planet one way or another through the etheric model, through the etheric field, through the magnetic energy streams. We're all connected. And as we contaminate those streams and contaminate that energy, they all are impacted. And so, yeah, they may not be going crazy, but there's the graph is going like this the rebalancing graph, the attempt to rebalance, the buildup of etheric energy, the buildup of etheric energy, which will cause pressure changes from the interior of a planet to outward. That's like a volcanic reaction. The pressure change that could cause a, an expansion or a, a hard energy pulse, an, a magnetic pulse, a, a, a vortex pulse of energy that can lead to strong earthquakes um, that can cause also intense vortex storms in an atmosphere all of those things are pressure related that relate to an etheric flow and a disruption of that or a disruption of that or a blocking if you will of that etheric flow and so anytime there's that type of man manifestation you know it has to do with some sort of etheric process from the magnetic energy model and you're saying that uh, other scientists know this you're not alone. Top, oh, no, no, yeah. The, the top secret scientists know this for sure. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm preaching to the choir for those guys. They're just like, whatever, we know all that. But what are they going to, you know, I mean, that's not mean they're going to get into a university and teach it because it's all, the etheric model has essentially been abandoned by conventional science. Mm -hmm. And, but the funny thing is, is it's kind of like makes it, it's, it's been making its headway back into conventional science for decades under different names and different concepts. And partly because of quantum mechanics and the experiments and like, wait, well, sp spooky action at a distance, like Einstein used to talk about. But now there's, you know, 
thousands of experiments that demonstrate this instantaneous connection through quantum entanglement, through split photon experiments, which I, I don't even want to get into that because I think all of that's kind of BS. But anyway, but the idea though of instantaneous action at a distance to the point where we even, China has satellites where they have quantum communication, now we're going into quantum com computing and all these things. And it's like, well, wait, 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 you can't have instantaneous action at a distance without some sort of medium to have that action taking place. So then they create things like, well, let's call it quantum foam. <laughs> Okay, it's quantum foam. So now we've got quantum foam. So that, that can explain how you can have quantum entanglement and you can have something communicating with something else, you know, a million light years away instantaneously. But see, from the magnetic energy model, yeah, that's the etheric model. That's, the, that's how magnetic energy works. That's how fast it is. And that energy is always flowing through everything all the time. And when we get that to that level of technology, we'll monitor it. We'll monitor it on our bodies. We'll monitor it in the environment. We'll monitor the exchange. We'll monitor the contamination of that flow and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are, they, what are these bizarre, untrackable elements that are, that, that are coming through our system? Like, what is that? Oh, wow. Is that, is that thorium? Is that plutonium? <laughs> what is that? You know, it's like all these things are like buildups. They're buildups. They're buildups. And there's, cause there's no etheric template for all those bizarre elements that we have created as humanity, that we have distorted. We haven't created anything, but that we've manipulated and we've manipulated the elemental configurations in our dimension but there's no matching higher dimension template for any of those. So there's no etheric, there's no etheric flow. They literally are bouncing against the etheric membrane and creating pressure, 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 pressure until they're forced through into a redistribution process. And so that, that causes a massive problem in the etheric model. So. Um. I hope that the viewers are staying with us through this because it, it is, it's fascinating and it's very meaningful. And, uh, but we are, you know, probably we're running out of time now. So I wonder what the takeaways are from this. I mean, what, what, would, you, what would you like to leave us with? Um, that uh, humanity is definitely contributing to climate change, <laughs> <laughs> both to climate extremes. I would say that that would be from the magnetic energy model. That's the more accurate way of saying it is that humanity is contributing to the climate extremes. Mm -hmm. So the idea of heat and cold and more storms and more volcanoes or more earthquakes or high on ionos ionospheric lightning, which nobody cares about that because it doesn't really affect us directly, at least not that we are aware of, but to any type of climate extreme, Yes, I, humanity is making a very significant contributions and Lord help us, that needs to stop. <laughs> so individually, there are things that we can do, but more collectively and perhaps politically or academically, there are things that could be done that are perhaps more difficult to do because of the difficulty. Yeah. People like well, and, so and that's and so so the bigger picture around this is okay first of all from a low vibratory point of view from a limited consciousness point of view when we are in a cycle which we are just wrapping up of of that type of energy lower vibratory energy none of this is a surprise okay we haven't, humanity and our destruction and our pollution and contaminating the system, none of this is a surprise. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a byproduct of the, the vibratory rate that we've been in on this planet, okay? It's a, it's a byproduct of, of having a type of consciousness that has a very difficult time seeing past the empirical, that has a very difficult time looking like humans right now have a very difficult time seeing outside of themselves. They have a, it's hard to imagine something they can't see, touch, smell, put into a laboratory and analyze it. 
So the, the etheric flow, the energy flow, that's not something that we are aware of, that people just are not aware of that. But as our, as our consciousness expands, as our heart energy blossoms, as we start to tune in and that vibratory rate, again, this is coming back to the heart energy, as our heart energy expands and we start to live more from that energy, more from the heart center, we will tune in to the etheric flows that happen on this planet and how those flows are being disrupted by our current technology and our current practices. And when that happens, we will all, including, and this is the big thing, is corporations and governments will get on board with change and with modifying things and with creating a system that is more harmonious to the planet. Um, and that's and there and 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 in that process there could be some pretty serious disruption and revolution. <laughs> but on the other side of that, it's 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 a matter of the leaders and the people and the corporations saying, you know what, no, this isn't this isn't right. We can't do this anymore. We can't produce this type because because the 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 energy fields we're creating are literally disrupting the planet. We have to move to a type of technology that is compatible with the earth that is compatible with the magnetic resonance signatures of the earth and that contribute to our flow into the rest of the system in a positive manner, not a negative manner. And so that transformation, that transformation to consciousness, that transformation in technology, that's really the answer to all of this. And, and that's not, and I'm not saying don't worry about it, don't do anything now, still do it. We've got to still each of us Still, we need to follow our hearts and what our heart guidance is in this moment. And if your heart guidance is telling you, yes, I need to, you know, recycle or I need to buy solar panels or whatever it is that, you know, that's, that's great. All of that's still good because that resonance, following that heart resonance and, and reinforcing that heart guidance and that resonance is very important right now on the planet. So I don't want to dismiss anything that someone would do for the environment from a heart point of view, okay? I think every person that starts to follow that heart guidance, that builds that resonance around the planet and, and not only strengthens that own individual's energy field and their own abilities, it heightens their own abilities, it heightens their own awareness, but that vibratory rate of increase spreads to the rest of humanity. And if that means that recycling makes you feel love for the planet, then, then, and you're doing that for, then do it. So because from what you said before, we're in that process already. Yes. We're in that process of transformation. Yes. And perhaps during the course of this decade, we'll see, we'll see the, the process strengthening more and more. So yes. we might expect the climate not to get just too extreme before we manage to turn the whole right. thing around. Right. And, uh, well, I've just lost your audio. Wonder why. Can you hear me? I've just lost. Oh, are we back? Are you back? Okay. Oh, yeah, we're back. <laughs> But I mean, when you look around the planet, like in this last hurricane season, and at one given time, there are, you know, four, five, six hurricanes slash tsunami around the planet, all at once in the oceans, that's a, that should be an indication <laughs> to climatologists, to governments, to corporations, something is out of whack, especially when they, and, and this is, I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but the top secret programs have satellites that monitor the ionosphere very carefully, very precisely, and they can see the disturbance that happens above every hurricane in the ionosphere before it even starts. That disturbance already, it all starts up in the upper ionosphere and inside of the interior of the earth. So that, that connection is the birth, the birthing energetic connection of every hurricane of every tornado that's how they are birthed and that draw that is a system rebalancing draw that is a corrective action 
That is the system telling you, I am having a difficult time processing this energy because the, the magnetic resonance signatures are distorted. So I'm creating a stronger draw, stronger draw, stronger draw, stronger draw until I can rebalance this because there's a deficit in the energy field. And I have to, the system is, the etheric flow is saying, I am going to fill that deficit no matter what. I'm going to keep trying. And all of a sudden you'll have hurricane here, hurricane here, hurricane here, three in a row. And then on the other side of the planet, three more in a row. And, and that's, so that tells us that the system, the etheric flow is struggling. That's not natural. Okay. That's, oh, it's just natural. It's just natural. No, that's not natural. The, the system is struggling and it's, and it's going to keep rebalancing no matter what. It's designed to do that. And it will do it to the point where it gets very extreme. It's not going to stop until it is rebalanced, until it achieves <laughs> harmony, mm -hmm. <laughs> until it achieves that, that homogeneous field, the field that is complete. It's not going to stop until it gets there. And so we've got some, the roller coaster, we've, we've been on, the, the mild part of the roller coaster. <laughs> We're at the part right now, you know, in the roller coaster where it goes, ch -ch 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 -ch. that's where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. We're going up. Ch -ch 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 -ch. That, the, the down and the crazy part, the loop the loops, mm -hmm. that's coming. <laughs> We've just been going through the fun kitty part, the turns, the fun stuff, you know, little thing. We're getting to the big stuff now. <laughs> The big stuff is coming because so the system good. is not going to stop. That'll motivate us perhaps to seriously. <laughs> it it, it will. What we're doing. It will. What we need to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a change in consciousness will reveal that, that yes, we've been ignorant, that we've been selfish, that we've been greedy, that we've been all those lower vibratory energies. It will reveal all that. And that's fine. That was part of a cycle. We grew from it. We learned a lot of great things. It's time to move forward. It's time to embrace love. It's time to embrace our heart energy. It's time to embrace our oneness. It's time to work together. It's time to heal the planet, to heal ourselves, to heal each other. It's time to embrace a brighter, better, bigger, glorious future that, that respects the planet that is not based on greed, that is not based on selfish motivation and all that, that, that is more enlightened. And that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the result of this process. That's the, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It literally is the dawning of a golden age of civilization. That's where we're moving. That's a great takeaway. Thank you, Thank you very much. I really, yeah, that's great. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Until next time. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you.